this thing it means so much to to um it's something that that is important that we know because yep. a lot of a lot of uh people are jackbarring without knowing the like i always say the underbelly yes of, of what is happening you know and, and that can have very grave consequences it can so i think we're live now so uh <laughs> hello everyone and welcome to eb speaks I am your host, Ibi Nabo Enebi. Today on EB Speaks, we'll be talking about how to avoid mental health breakdown in second generation mig migrants. And I have been doing series on, or rather uh, this, actually this is a series I've been doing since July on mental health, sorry, on um, jackwaring. And jackwaring simply means relocating. And we've talked about several things um, so if you want to check out some of the videos I've done, you can go to my YouTube channel, Ibinabo and Nabi. I have, we talked about the first things you need to know. We talked about um, how to, uh, you know, how to um, bring up a holistic uh, migrant child. We talked about jobs. You know, we tried, I tried to cover some of the things that you don't really think about when you're thinking about re relocating. And today we're going to handle again, one of the ticking, it's a ticking time bomb, mental health among migrants. It's something that we're not aware that is happening or rather it's happening, but we don't know. And it is very uh, rife in second generation migrants. And I have a special guest today, Dr. John Malaka. Dr. John, welcome to EB Speaks. Oh, thank you so much, EB. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I know you're very busy, but thank you so much for taking time out. And Dr. John uh, works in the Republic of Ireland. So Dr. John, before we start this conversation proper, can you yes. just talk about, and guys, sorry, before, before Dr. John talks, you can be a part of this conversation by uh, leaving your comments in the comment box if you're watching via YouTube, or LinkedIn or Facebook. It, this is an, an interactive session and Dr. John would answer your questions. So Dr. John, um, before we delve into the conversation, would you mind just talking about yourself and just give, I'll, you know, just give, let the audience meet you. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ibi. So um, as, as Ibi said, you know, I'm, I'm John Malika. Um, I'm, a Nigerian, <laughs> a medical doctor who hails originally from Nigeria, you know, but even though I'm now an Irish citizen by, as, you know, by living, by, by the fact that I've been living here since 2015. Yeah. Uh, and I've been working within the, the mental health service since I came to Ireland, that, that's over eight years ago. I've worked in, in both disciplines of adult and child mental health, you know, and in generally helping in, you know, in, in looking after patients with mental disorders. And I've also more, more recently been involved in, in, in some ways, trying to promote mental wellness, you know, in the community. In uh, the honest, African community. Especially the African community, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Malaka, once again, I just want to thank you very much for doing this. And it's, you know, I, I have words fail me in even having this conversation. And I, I just I, I just want to start by asking you, yes. is, is there really a rise in mental health situations in second generation migrants? And for people who don't understand what second generation migrants are, yes. again, who are second generation migrants? Okay, well, so, um, okay, I, I'll... I'll, I'll start with the second question <laughs> yeah. to lead to the first. So um, a, a, if a first generation migrant will be somebody like um, yourself and myself who yeah. came from a, a different country and relocated to, you know, to Ireland or to any other country in the, in the Western diaspora and, and is, um, you know, and, and settled in that community, you know, so migrating from one community to another. And a second generation migrant um, immigrant will be, our children, you know, um, that's the, the, these are the children who are born here in Ireland, you know, 
from uh, of of first generation uh, migrant parents. Yeah, so that that would by that would unofficially be the definition of a second generation migrant um, immigrant and. Um, and like you said, you know, there has been a rise, you know, I think, I think it's quite obvious that there has been, it, it, there's generally, there's been a, a rise in the amount of, of second generation immigrants presenting to mental health services, you know, or, or generally um, having, uh, you know, a variety of mental health disorders and, and mental health difficulties. And, um, well, there, there are different studies that have, you know, talked about this, if we're talking about the evidence, you know, no. I, I think a major factor is the fact that, like I was telling you before we started, is you know the fact that there has been an increase in a number of 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 immigrants, you know, into the Republic of Ireland and even in in general in the in yeah the Canada area. and uh, everywhere. Yes, so. in, I'll say in the last 10, 15 years, I'll say you know like every but, but... every five years, you, you're probably having uh, you know like it it almost doubles in terms of the number of of immigrants coming into the country. And and it's a known fact scientifically from evi from the evidence that um, mental illness tends to be higher amongst uh, immigrants. So obviously, if there's a rise in number of immigrants, there will be a rise in the in the pattern and presentations of mental illness amongst this group. Okay, Dr. John, I just want to ask you a question now. Well, of course, I'm asking you a question. Has it always been like this in the six in the sixties and seventies and eighties and nineties that a lot of uh, second generation migrants would have had mental health breakdown well i mean the um the evidence has been pretty consistent you know in over the years but 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 obviously you have to look at if, you know the timeline being that um immigration in itself has become more prevalent it has become more, more en masse you know worldwide probably especially in places like ireland probably in the past you know in the 15, last 20 couple, years 20 years couple of decades you know so um so with, with the fact that we're seeing more of a rise in immigrants coming into the country where a lot of the problems that that are common in this group are becoming more and more rampant you know so it's it's almost to be expected you know you know really? that that's the case. yes in the sense that from the like from some of the 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 research that have been done amongst migrant groups the the causes and and the the predispositions to mental illness in that group have been consistent yes there have been changes over the years you know with with laws around immigration and and setting things setting laws that create even more difficulties for immigrants migrating into the country now than it would have been 15 years ago you know there's always new laws coming up and these create more challenges and and it, it's it's been proven that you know there's a there's a theory that for people um, with with more social adversity there's a rise in mental illness especially psychosis so if you're going by 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 the by by the evidence you could say that obviously once there's a rise in the number of of, of migrants especially in the past 20 years there's obviously going to be a rise in mental illness in general because like in the UK you, the, a lot of studies have confirmed that um, the rate of of mental illness, especially psychosis, amongst um, immigrants, especially um, looking specifically at, at um, black ethnic minorities, is about they have it. They are is six times more likely in that group than in the general population. So they are more prone, you know. And this is not because they are more. They are generally um, genetically more prone to mental illness than than their counterparts. No. But it's is likely is more related to to the process and the factors around immigration because when they did certain studies comparing the uh, rate of mental illness in different countries like in the UK and in Nigeria and other countries they found that it was more or less the same. So there's something about this process of immigration and and acculturation trying to settle in a new community and with and bearing in mind all the difficulties that are associated with that that gives rise that gives you know that leads to this rise in to, mental illness. To that. Yes. Well, Dr. John, you know, you know, when you were just saying this, like, I'm just thinking. Yes. Um, a lot of Nigerians are said to be, like they said, Nigerians are said to be one of the most successful migrant groups in the United States of America. Yes. And even when, even in Ireland and even, you know, where, everywhere we go, we work very hard. So yes. when people from home see 
us or see people that are living abroad, there is the there is the thought or the thinking that so long as you are abroad, I mean, it's like you're in heaven. So there we are saying that even though Nigerians or migrants, or I'll say Nigerians because that's what I'm you know, familiar with, are yes. successful wherever they go. Yes. Like we have even just the, the doctors and the nurses and, you know, even setting up businesses, even the musicians, you know, are all doing very well. Yes. There is, I, and I keep, and I would use this word and I use it very carefully, that there is an underbelly of horror that the yes. migrant community is facing. Mm-hmm. And one of which is mental health breakdown. Now, I want us to take, you said two things and I wrote down, you said that we're more there, 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 so there are the causes and the predisposition. So what are the things that can cause it? And what are the things that we're predisposed to that can cause it? Okay, well, um, so if we're talking about the, about the possible causes of mental illness, you, um, then, then you, ca- you kind of have to divide the migrant group into the first generation and second generation migrants. Yeah. Because there are different factors that apply to both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for first generation migrants, you know, um, r- removing the genetics, because we've already said that, you know, genetically everyone in the world is prone to mental illness. But 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 coming down to the nitty-gritty in terms of what, what are the factors that first generation migrants like yourself and myself face. So yeah. it is so a lot of people who migrate, you know, who Im- immigrate into the country. It, it possibly could be due to adverse conditions that they were facing in their own country, you know, yeah. back at home in Nigeria, you know, so there, there are situations, whether, whether it's due to poverty in some places, you know, for some other countries, it could be trauma, you know, war and other very serious, you know, traumatic events in their lives yeah. that, that have led them to flee from their country. You know, some people flee because um, certain laws in their own country do not favor them based on yeah. their on their sexuality, their beliefs, their religion, whatever. Yeah. And so, and already those factors already in its in themselves already make them predisposed, even before they get into the country, into Ireland, you know. And then coming into into the country, there are so many adversities that yeah. immigrants face yes. when they are trying to settle in a new country. Yes. You know, as, you know so there are so many. There are so many. You know, in terms of dealing with immigration, with authorities, you know, empl- employment, unemployment, you know, the, uh, trying to get around certain laws that are very limiting. You know, you have people who come with all sorts of um, background, you know, backgrounds and level of high level of education, but- But, but are, having are to do laws. menial jobs. Yes, facing laws that are not favorable. And, and also, we also have an orientation, you know, back back home and I was, now, I'm, I'm now switching towards the second generation Im- migrants now immigrants now you know who even though they may not face the same challenges that you and I may face you know because they, they already we, we have had to do all the hard work <laughs> of dealing with the, and, and they are we born bent in our, our backs for them to climb we, we have exactly we've broken our backs basically you know but, but but then they have their own challenges because interestingly there was a study done in the UK that actually confirmed that um, based on that study, that there was a higher rate uh, and a higher predisposition to mental illness, especially psychosis, among second generation immigrants compared to first generation, which is, which sounds weird, you know, because you're like, okay, if these second generation immigrants are not facing all of those social adversities and and those challenges that that their parents face, because they are they are they are they are they are, they are natural born citizens within the country, why are they having a higher predisposition? So apparently, some of the factors, the things you mentioned, you know, about us being a very driven people, you know, and we have we have some of our beliefs that are ingrained in us before coming here. Some some of those things, and I'll be talking about this a bit more as we go along, I believe, yeah. could create yeah. a a serious barrier for the second generation immigrants, for our children, while trying to hey. settle in, in in this country. Because bear in mind that these children are. Irish citizens, you know, or by, British you know, or Americans or Canadian, or British or American, or you know, regardless, depending on where they are, you know, and that's their orientation. But then, if they are being raised in a in a household where where certain values and belief systems, which are not consistent with the with, in, with the general society, are being are being enforced and upheld, it could create a, a serious um, 
imbalance. Yes, an, an imbalance, a dichotomy of, you know, in terms of how, uh, what what the expectations are and how they're expected to live. Like, for instance, but, okay, you mentioned yeah. about, uh, you know, like setting, you know, employments, like first generation immigrants based on our orientation, like in Nigeria, you know, being very driven towards setting jobs. And, and that's simply because, you know, it, based on the economy and based on society, they're setting stigma, setting jobs, setting jobs are, are looked down on and are frowned upon, and, and only only certain types of exposure, certain types of jobs are, are being are almost being imposed. You know, like you must be a doctor, or a, a lawyer, minister. doctor, engineer, yes. architect. Yes, yes, and and if we are going to impose those same standards, you know, on our children or on second generation immigrants, it could, in 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 a different society, it could create very intense pressure for this for this group of people you know who are trying to figure themselves out they're in a different society yeah. where the same laws do not apply to them because they have way more options than we had you know we thought it was only it's only until you become a this or a that you know whereas they have way more options but then by imposing some of these values we it could in some ways work against you know their 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 general mental well-being as well well, wow, this is this is um it's it's I don't know it's is it very interesting because and again I wanted to say this because we're having a conversation and you know the way the first generation um the first generation migrants must have also been through the trauma of immigration yes the trauma of settling yes the trauma of trying to get a job the trauma of missing your family and not having the the support that you'd have had back home so there is the trauma right so as a first generation you're dealing with that trauma yes and then the children also now are here but they're they don't think like you think no so could it be that somehow that aside from and what you're saying is a fact but could it be that somehow we also kind of like transfer our trauma to them without knowing. We transfer our fears to them without knowing. So that kind of like upsets and causes some form of imbalance. Absolutely. And and also, you know, just to add to what you just said, I think you really hit the nail on the head. You know, yes, there is that tendency that based on setting traumas and adversities, that we have had to face, you know, in, in you know, based on from our childhood and in, in the process of relocation, you know, it's possible that without knowing, because we, we you want, we, everybody wants the best for their children, you know, that's mm-hmm. the truth, you know, everybody wants them to do well, but then we might, without knowing, be almost, there's almost like a transference, you know, of some of these ideas based on our traumas, based on our, on our perceptions of, you know, of, of society, you know, it could be even due to certain de- dealings we've had. You've had very unfortunate dealings with certain, of, um, you know, authority, authorities, authorities like you know, immigration. You know, the, it could be know, the police, the police, you know, whatever, or whatever. You know, and if, and if we're if if we are transferring some of those fears, you know, to these group of people, you know, and and we're making them believe that look, if you don't if you don't achieve this this and that then you're nobody and, and you would amount to nothing. You know, it's, it's very possible that we, without knowing, we, we, are, we, are, we are already setting them up by creating, putting them under a lot of pressure. And bear in mind that because some, some of these pressures that, that we've had to face might have even increased our resilience, you know, and they may not have the same level of resilience, you know, because they have different, you know, everybody faces trauma in one way or the other, regardless of whether you're in Nigeria, America, anywhere, you know, but 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 we all have. You tend to build a level of resilience for your own trauma, you know, and and then if you are adding yours to theirs, you know, and in, a, in layman's terms, you know, we're making things even more difficult. And like you mentioned, certain things there are certain factors that also affect, you know, this, the the second generation, like in the process of immigration of migration, some families get split up. You could have yeah, yeah. a single parent say that. situation. You know, and 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 obviously, you know, back home in you know, like in Nigeria, the family, you know, both the nuclear and the extended family, is like a very secure base, you know, for in terms of promoting and maintaining mental well-being. You know, yeah. So so when 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 there's a fracture 
in, 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 in within the family, whether it's due to or, um, one parent not being able to come over or, or, the, or, or, or a, a breakdown in relationship, things like that, you know, that could be, that could have their consequences for, for, for the children within, within that, that space. Yeah, doctor, another thing right, that I think is that, I mean, just correct me if I'm wrong, is mm -hmm. that, so we still have a certain level of connection to our home base. So yes. we have our cousins, we have our grandma in the village, we have our friends, schoolmates. So we still have, especially now with WhatsApp, where you can actually link up with your secondary school, um, yes. secondary school mates and all those things so we still are grounded but yes. somehow I feel that that the second generation children yes are not going home some parents make the mistake of trashing where they come from to their children yeah. and whether we like it or not right even though we're 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 in a new country where we're now home I feel that it is important that, that our children should have a sense of their, even if they're, even if they are their dual citizens, they should have the complete sense of their duality. So if yeah. you're if you're an Indian Irish or Indian American or um Nigerian American or Nigerian Irish or Nigerian British, I feel that you should have the fullness of your Nigerianness and then have the fullness of your Irishness. In that way, you will be whole. Yes. But sometimes, you know, some of us trash our, our, where we're from. So the children are not read, are, are, are in between. And whether you like it or not, you are who you are. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yes. you are who you are. And sometimes those situations can present themselves and then there is that talk. Yes. And I, I think you were totally right on that point. And I, I like the fact that you even used the example of, um, you know, like a, an, a, an Indian Irish, you know, or Indian American, you know, second generation immigrant. Uh, and why, why I said that is because uh, apparently um, the Asian community have proven to be very good you know in in enabling the process of acculturation and this has been confirmed even in studies because you know in some of the studies um focusing on migrants in the uk and in ireland you know it was shown that within some of those even amongst the, the immigrant community some 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 ethnic minorities were faring better in terms of mental wellness than others really yes like like, like in certain members of the asian community and it is possible, even though this wasn't explored further, but it is possible. But there, there tends to be a general, a general, and concerted effort within those communities to promote a sense of identity within the children. Because, like you said, you know, like yes, I mean, our kids are born here, they they grow up here, they're Irish citizens. But you know, but who do they see when they look in the mirror? You know, and the fact that they, yeah. yeah the fact that they are different, you know, they, they know they are they become, they become aware as they grow older that yes, I live here, I, I sound like an like 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 somebody who is from here, whether it's from America, from the UK, but 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 when but I, I but look I, in the mirror, like, exactly when you look in the mirror, <laughs> you, know, you, you know that you know that you still not feel that you know that you're different, you know, yeah. and and if if you don't have any sense of connection with where you're from, with your roots, you know, th 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 that could definitely lead to is a, a sense a, a low self-esteem you know going forward you know because if if for any reason you, you you are faced with people get faced with certain types of you know yeah feelings of inequality you know racism whatever it is ha ha having a sense of identity can be quite protective in those situations having a sense of identity can be quite protective being grounded in yeah. who you are being exactly. grounded in knowing who you are you know when Yes. You know, in those days in the village, I, like I'm very proud of my villageness. I say that <laughs> all the time. My grandmother, and in retrospect, when I look, when when I when I think about my life personally, I just thank God for what my dad did. 
We yeah. spent time, we'd go, go to the village. We spent time, well, my hometown. I didn't go to my village, village, village. Okay. Yeah, but my hometown. So we'd see my granny. My grandmother would tell us about my great grandfather. Wow. Tell us of all the ancestors. Then I, I know my cousins. I know my mother's compound. You know, that kind of way. So, and I could speak my language very well. And I, and I know wow. my culture. Okay. You know, so yeah. that makes me a well, a well-balanced person. Yes. Because when I'm with my people, I am sure once I see my, my town person, no more English. Yes. You know, so for yeah. me, that is really important that you have a sense of belonging. Yes. You know, yeah. you have a sense of belonging. And a lot of times I've heard people say that sometimes I, I feel that when some of us, you know, have children, we, we forget. And now, and you said this, right? You talked about how sometimes we impose our ideas on the kids. Yeah. But sometimes also, there's nothing wrong in reminding your child about who you are. This is what we do in our, the good things in our culture anyway. Because again, yeah. it, it, it enables uh, their identity. That's what the Indians do. The, the, the Indians have a community. Yes. During their Diwali, they all come together. They, so yeah. that's why they thrive. Yeah. That, that is that is so true. I mean, like the 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 perfect example. And because I remember when I was doing um, some studying in this area for for exams <laughs> for medical exams a, a few years ago, the perfect example of acculturation that was used in the text was an Indian child, you know, an Indian born, you know, uh, who who was a second generation immigrant in America, who who could speak his language fluently. Who could go go to go go to with his workmates to the pub and have a normal conversation, you know? But then, but then when he goes back home, he could wear his you know his traditional attire and speak his language fluently. That was the gold standard of a fully you know um, somebody who has been fully acculturated, acculturalized, acculturalized. Sorry, sorry, thanks for thanks for filling in the gaps. <laughs> but but that, that, that's the example of somebody who has been fully, you know, acculturized into that into the community. There's a, a complete integration of both his, you know, his um, ethnic, you know, roots and background, and the community in which he's now living and residing. You know, and that's some, and like you said, um, th there's a, there's a tendency that maybe based on difficulties we faced, based on, on our own perceptions, we can transfer some of the, of those negative be, um, beliefs. You know, to the younger generation, and the fact is that no, no nation in the world is perfect. You know, not 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 Nigeria, not India, definitely not Ireland or the UK or America. You know, but if if we continue to focus on only the negative things, if that's all your your kids I, I'll hear about your home country, then they're going to have this belief that okay, well, you know, maybe maybe there isn't much to 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 the identity, anyways. If 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 the entire country is known for you know, either corruption, okay. this or that. Yeah. Whereas, like you pointed out, it, there are so many wonderful things, you know, about about the culture, about the people, the language, you know, and, and it's important that we try not, we, we focus, we don't focus only on the negatives, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's important we give them the full perspective. Exactly. It's important that we give them, when we were doing our naturalization um, thing, the justice minister said this, and I was so impressed. She said, Tell your children the stories that were told you. Tell them the stories. Let them eat your food. I don't. I, I think she also said that which is important that the children go home to know where they come from. Wow. You know because it helps. I I, I think she said that, but I knew she said if I if I'm not mistaken that tell them your stories, the stories that they told you at home. Tell your children, because I feel that it's important that we know who we are because really when you look in the mirror <laughs> that's a new one okay Dr. Malakad I want us to talk about how to recognize yes mental breakdown within the second generation okay okay 
So first of all, I mean, sorry, sorry don't mind me. I, I tend to be a bit academic, academic about these things. You're, so, you're, you're a doctor. It's just <laughs> you're a professional. So I'll try not to be too boring. But, but yeah. what is the mental breakdown, essentially? A, a mental breakdown is a period of distress, you know, intense mental distress, you know, and it could be due, where we have in very intense feelings of, you know, anxiety, worry, you know, and, and that, that leads to a lack of functioning. You know, you just can't cope with your day-to-day life. You can't function as a, as, as a, as a, as a member of society, as, as a mother, as a parent, you know, you know, in your, in your job, you know, your, even your daily functioning, your sleeping, your eating. And um, one of the, I know we're going to be busting a few myths as we go along in this, yeah, you know, yeah. in this session, and one of the one of the first myths I want to 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 bust completely is is you know like the issue of how can we prevent you know the mental breakdown. The reality is that we you can't all the time. So everybody is prone to having mental health distress or a mental breakdown, you know. But now, but what we can do is that what what the, what what are the aim the ideal aim will be, you know, and what we'll be trying to communicate. Is the, is the importance of one trying to help to you know prevent as much as possible and when it happens we're trying to to salvage and to and to support so that it doesn't deteriorate into a mental illness or a mental health disorder because like I said everybody is prone to having a mental breakdown at some point you know but not everybody will will, will have a mental illness or a mental disorder. So how can we prevent, you know, one from leading to the other? I, I think that that is that that is the actual, you know, that would be the ideal goal. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm writing whatever you're saying. I'm writing it down. Okay. Yeah, right. So yeah. So yeah. We're, we're not in the lecture room, Ibi. <laughs> you said we're having so, a conversation here. <laughs> we are, but I'm just learning. So yeah. So sorry. So now, what would be? So what's the mental breakdown? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like I said, um, now. I, I know in a, when you hear mental breakdown, you know, there's that, we have this dramatic explosion of, you know, you know, of things just going out of control mm. and somebody losing their mind completely, like, like in the Nigerian Nollywood movies. <laughs> but, but in reality, um, like I said, a, a mental breakdown is, is just simply any period of intense emotional distress, you know, where, where we, we get overwhelmed with anxieties and worries. It could be due to a current situation you know that's causing you intense stress you know and, and that 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 eventually begins to affect your ability to cope with day-to-day life your ability to function you know as a person as a you know in whatever capacity or role that you normally would function now why, why i said it's not you know I, I mentioned the fact that it's not it doesn't have to be dramatic is that it's it really it could be sometimes but it really depends on the person because we all have different personalities so Somebody who with a, with a very with a very calm and quiet and introverted personality might be having a mental breakdown, and it doesn't even look like a storm in the teacup, you know. But but, but and so what, what the um, the purpose of our conversation now is to try to identify in different situations if somebody is in some ways suffering or struggling, whether they're asking for help or not. How can we identify? How can we encourage them to get help, and how can we help them in some situations actually get help? Yeah, um, that's 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 it. Yes, that that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so for instance, like you know, we're talking about um, second generation um, immigrants. You know, like so, so that's um, you know, children who were born in you know in in diaspora in Ireland in the UK in America, and it's and another thing to to point out, having worked in both the adult and child mental health, is that. Um, mental health illness and even mental health distress presents in different ways amongst different age categories. Okay. We're not going to be able to go through that in a podcast. (laughs) We're not because, you know, like every age group, you know, depression in a five-year-old and depression in a 16-year-old and depression in in somebody my age is different. Doctor, wait a minute. Doctor, wait a minute, please. Okay. So a five-year-old can have depression? Absolutely. You know, because the... The perception that we have is yes. It's like, let me just speak in pidgin English. Now, waiting they worry. <laughs> I bet they come up for their journey. You know that's the way we are. You never even say yes. anything for life. Yeah. Depression key you there. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's the way. <laughs> yes. So it's possible then 
for yes. a five-year-old to have depression. Yes, depression, psychosis, or or any of the you know broader major mental illness. You know, and and like I, like I was saying, how we how it, somebody who of a younger age will present is totally different. But but one and, and like like I said, we can't go we, we we can't cover that in a podcast. You know, because you might have a five an infant or, or a five-year-old who is not eating as normal. Who is not, you know, functioning the way they would normally the normal five year old would. But the core thing that that's just, that the core feature across every group, every age group, or every age category is that when somebody is going through intense mental health distress, or somebody is going to, or having a mental health breakdown or mental illness, is they, there's a, there's going to be a change in their day to day functioning in some way in some capacity. You know, so if you have that child who is normally extroverted, normally friendly, at least, you know, who would normally sit, you know, with the family and have dinner, you know, and you notice that your child is is isolating themselves from everyone, you know, not hanging out with their friends, not doing the things they love doing, you know, normally, and and uh, maybe staying away from family events and, you know, and keeping to themselves, you know, and, and we might say, oh, he's becoming a teenager, he's be, he, she's just a bit shy. But but it, you might need as a parent you might need to look a bit closer and observe and see what else is going on you know because that person might actually need some extra support. Okay, so you know the way um, we Africans, yeah, we send our children to school overseas. Yes, you know, or you're living in one part of the UK or Ireland, and then you send your child to school in another area. Yes, and. You, and you know, we always say that children, the children of nowadays, this this generation, they don't answer phone calls, they don't respond to anything except they need money. <laughs> you know, so if you have a child that is not responding to your calls, your texts, could that be something you should be worried about? Well, absolutely. I mean, it obviously depends on the context. You know, young people these days could could get really carried away with technology, <laughs> and they forget, you know, to keep in touch with their parents. But 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 definitely, if somebody who is normally who would normally keep in touch, you know, like obviously some some people we all have different um, when it comes to social engagement. You know, yeah. we all have different levels. You know, you would always have that sibling who might not reply your messages all the time. I could be guilty of that sometimes. You know? Yeah, and it doesn't mean I'm having a, a mental breakdown. But but if we had, but if like I said, if it's somebody who would normally you know get back to you, normally engage, and you notice that there's a, a withdrawal, you know, and there's a change, it might be something worth looking into. You know, and yes, I know in Africa, it, like when I was growing up, it was, was always a, stat, a status thing. You know, when a family say, oh, yes, we sent, you know, one of our kids, you know, to the UK and another one to America to study. You know, and sometimes when when people relocate to different parts of the world, you cannot be, with, obviously, a lot of the time, you can't be with your actual birth family. But but there are, you know, but thankfully, there are there are other types of families <laughs> that evolve in these situations, you know. Yeah. Like it doesn't always have to be the family from which you were, you know, that you were born into, you know, like even here in Ireland, you know, I have an, an Irish family as well as my family back home, you know, yeah. and who I go to every, every Christmas, you know, with my, with, with, with my kids and, and my wife and, you know, we, we hang out together, we share stories together, even though we have different backgrounds, you know, but we've been, we've become a family by, by, by virtue of circumstance, you know. Yeah, but, but you know that sometimes, like I have a few um, Irish uh families people that are my friends and you find that that we're only we're only different by color so true that we we share the same values (laughs) yeah we have the same jokes in a way yes and family is important yes we're the same yes we're the same yes yeah. There's only one race, the human race. That's the human race, exactly. Yes. We're all pulled together by our humanity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about the breakdown, and you said something. Okay. Then how does it become the full bloom? Yes. So you know, like there's always that um, th- there's always that misunderstanding or that misconception, you know, within. Um, Within mental within the mental health um, service, you know, people can't tell the difference really between, you know, what what's 
mental health, you know, mental health distress or, or just normal mental health, you know, um, difficulties and a mental disorder. So, okay, so what's the difference between um, uh, depressions, acute psychosis, um, what you might call it, disorder, and all of those things? Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, um, be it depression, psychosis, those are all mental health disorders. Right? Okay, and they don't come out of nowhere, you know. In okay. Sense that, so, so it's it's very possible. Like I, like we mentioned that when we're talking about the um, the the high rate of of mental illness amongst immigrants, we said that one of some of the predispositions could be, you know, the the intense trauma and the social adversity that immigrants have to overcome. Yeah. So when you're going through, when when a person who and don't and obviously it's very important I mentioned obviously that there is a genetic predisposition, you know. So, okay. like, so obviously if, if there's a family history of mental illness. It's been proven that there is a very high percentage, or there's a percentage at least, which is higher than the general population, that yeah. such a person could have a mental illness. Yes. But now, putting all those, um, all those other predispositions aside, when you're under intense, you know, um, emotional turmoil or distress, mm-hmm. you are, you, you are potentially anybody potentially is already at risk. Yeah. Yeah. And and then if. Now, obviously, your level of risk is higher if there are other factors like, you know, you know, childhood trauma, genetic, you know, history of mental illness. But when, if this in level of distress, if it's not, if it's not managed properly, if, if you don't get the right supports, it could eventually lead to a complete breakdown in functioning, you know. And, and that, that's the point at which people, st- we start manifesting the symptoms of a major mental health disorder like depression. You know, so you, somebody could go from being very distressed and and only being able to talk about their trauma, and and to not eating, not sleeping, you know, and and then if it progresses further, it could even be having very dark thoughts, you know. So so there is a there's a spectrum, you know. So it's you, you don't just wake up one day and become depressed, you know, or or have a psychotic breakdown. Usually there could be, potentially in 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 a lot in most cases, a lot of cases there could be telltale signs when somebody, somebody's mental health is being affected over a period of time. And, uh, and what we're talking about here is how can we support, you know, how can we help and how can we prevent in some cases so that we are not, you know, we don't end up adding to the causes of mental illness amongst our loved ones, you know. So what can we do to not add to the to the mental health. Oh, sorry, sorry, um, Ibi, I missed I, the first part of that statement. I, I said, so what can we do as parents? Okay. Not add to the to the mental health situation that our children are going through. Okay. Oh, all right. So, so um, yeah, that's a very good question. You know, that's why we're here. <laughs> all right. So, so um, there are a few tips that I actually um, kind of you know thought about and things that apply mostly to the African community, you know? Yeah. And um, so like, you know, uh, uh, like we said, the family is like the, 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 the basic, you know, framework of society. Yeah. And both in the Irish society and in the Nigerian society. So as a family, you know, and as parents, you know, if we're trying to maintain mental wellness amongst our kids, amongst yeah. our children, uh, there are certain things that we need to avoid, you know, okay. certain practices. Which, which are quite common in, within our culture. So like, you know, certain things like um, w- something that was very common, you know, um, w- w- for a lot, a, lot, a lot of people who might've grown up in, in Nigeria or in Africa is um, w- what we call um, lack of validation. Lack of validation, yes. in what way? Okay, so, okay, here I go again with definitions. So mm-hmm. what is val- validation is, is basically the recognition or affirmation of a person's feelings, you know, and, and, their, and their opinions, basically letting somebody know that their opinions are valid, you know. And there was a general, there, there in some African communities back then, hopefully it's, things are changing now, there was a general <laughs> um, op- feeling that a good child was a child who was only seen and not heard, you know. And, and there was that tendency <laughs> that, you know, um, the, the concept of a child coming to their parents with 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 
they are every with their day to day stresses and traumas. You're you're being a bit of a bother. You know, you're you're being you're being annoying or you're you're, you're a troublesome child. Whereas it's very important that it's been it's it's been proven that children who are able to express their emotions, who are given a free, you know, a free um, who are given a, who have a supportive environment where they can voice their opinions and and express their emotions, generally tend to do better in terms of being more aware of of their own emotions and their mental well being and their mental health. Doctor so, John, I, I just want I, w- I want to add to what you're saying. Okay. Well, not adding to what you're saying, but just confirming what you're saying. I think that in our culture, and sometimes I don't know why. We, no, we have good culture now, but there's sometimes when you know, in those days, when your parents are talking to you, like you're not supposed to look at them in the eye. <laughs> I, 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 I now you know yeah, the eye. if so you look at, if, if 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 you know an adult is talking to you generally and you look at them in the eye and they will say hey look at me very well look at me I, I, I. Look, look, can you see your eyes you know but when a stubborn I, child it's a stubborn child yes you, you're yes. not supposed to look into the into your parents eyes or what a misconception yes. I, I, and then sometimes you that kind of like bring up your child to look into your eyes and to talk to you and express themselves, so they say, "Hey, they spoil this became now." Yeah, you know. So I think that that is important. I think. Uh, and another point. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry to interject. Ibi, yeah, it's okay. Uh, on, it's your show. Point. Another point. Another thing. Um, another point that is very important is the fact that even though a lot of people would have had the same experience of some of these things that I was going to mention, like the lack of validation, you know, because it was a common experience. Like you can relate to it, I can relate to it. The next person can relate to and it, and we can laugh about it. And Can't. we can laugh about it. Yeah. So, it, so being a common experience, we we probably were, we're not as we're not even probably even traumatized by it. You know, if anything, it was just you know that was you know the, the way things were. You know, where where but but for children who are growing up in a different society where those rules do not apply. You know, so like like you said, you know, looking into the the eyes of an elder. I remember coming to work in Ireland. You know, I I realized quickly, you know, that if you're not when when engaging with with anyone, you know, if what you 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 regardless of whether they're a, a, a superior at work, you know, your your boss, you you look them straight in the eye, you know, and and you speak your truth, you know, because if you're not looking someone in the eye, then it's possible they, they, that they you're don't, being trust you. you're they don't trust you. You're dodgy. Yes. You're, you're being, that, that's the word you're being dodgy, you know. Yeah. We're, we're, but so, being that where these children are being raised in a different society, you know, so whatever, whatever, it's important to make sure that whatever practices that are going on in the home are not completely 180 degrees, you know, totally different from from what from from the standard experience. Not saying that you're trying to model what is happening in every single home, but but the problem, but the challenge is that if your child's experience is totally different from the experiences of their of their friends and of yeah. their peers. It could impact on them greatly, uh, and that, that and that in itself is what causes the higher perception of trauma amongst immigrant children. So, would it be safe then for your children, just yeah. like the Indians do, to like to like flock together? Because then we all have the same, but then that would be. I know, I know, I know. And you, obviously, you want your kids to have the, you know, the full experience, well you balanced, want to be exposed, yeah. well balanced. And it, and truth is that that even realistically, you know, that that's not even you know even under any circumstance that that's not that's not right. No, that's not realistic. Yeah, it's that that's mm-hmm. not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that your kids. I remember a friend of mine or a friend of my brother's actually. From secondary school, who who relocated to Poland years ago to to study to um, study medicine, you know, from secondary school, and then he was in touch with his parents from you know Ibadan, and he was that's in Nigeria, you know, and yeah. he was um, he was they were having Skype calls every now and then, and then one 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 blessed day he says to his mother, you know, that oh, I I want to introduce somebody to you. Look, apparently he had a a, a a a girlfriend who he who he intended to marry. And um, so his parents were anxiously looking forward to this wonderful reveal 
to see their their future to be daughter in law. I'm telling you. And to their greatest surprise, you know, there was this lovely, you know, um, red head, head Polish um, lady, you know, staring at them on the other end of the of the screen. And his mother was so okay. was nearly traumatized. I, I, you know, and the interesting thing was that he was probably the only, you know, um, African or the only, you know, black person in his year in school at that time. So how they expected him to bring back home an Ibadan lady beats me. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. Well, yeah. So, so the reality is that our kids are, I mean, they're, they're going to go out there. They're going to explore the world like healthy kids. They're yes. going to relate with other people and they're going to compare their experiences, you know. And, and like you said, not all the values that we learned from our childhood are bad. That would be, there are so many good values that we, that we were not talking about today, you know, you know, about, you know, the culture of respect. Respect. Of, yes. Yeah. Of, of respect caring, of for, caring for your parents. Caring for parents, we build empathy, you know, and so there are so many positive things, but but we're trying to curb those things that could be harmful. The excesses, or, yeah. The excesses, exactly. Yeah. So okay. talking about excesses, I I don't know how much time yeah we have. So we have we we have yeah we have time. Okay. So I, I mentioned you know one of the unhealthy practices was the lack of validation. Um, another thing as well is. We, we've talked about this already in a sense, you know, placing undue expectations on, on the children. So, so like, we, you know, we mentioned about how setting, you know, setting um, jobs, setting employment opportunities are prioritized, you know, within, in, in the mind of an African parent, you know, based on our exposures and our backgrounds on the society in which we grew up, you know, it was believed that you have to be either this, you know, a doctor, lawyer, engineer, and 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 now you you have this a, a generation of children growing up in a society where they have such a variety of opportunities. You know, it's mind blowing. You know, uh, you know, and and if we're if you are still uphold, uh, trying to uphold this limited sense, you know, of you have to be either this this or that, and you you give that child the impression that if they don't live up to your expectation, then they're you're failing. Disappointed. Their, 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 their failures, you know, and that's, and even though you might think you're motivating them, that, that could be a very heavy burden to carry at, at such a young age. So, you're very, um, so you're that's very, important. You're very right. You're very right in that regard. Mm -hmm. You're very right in that regard, yes. And, you know, again, this generation, some of them don't place value in university education. Yes. Like, there's so many ways in which you can actually get an education some of you can you can go even through the um what you may call it now apprenticeship yes you know the apprentice but i know that a lot of us don't want to hear that apprent <laughs> when we talk about apprenticeship remember that uh, yeah that's a uh, baba sikiru that is doing uh yes call it a meka mekalik you make yeah. a in one corner so you want so you mean to tell me that you come all the way from nigeria to come and do apprenticeship you know in the overseas yeah I know. when all your mates are doing a uh, 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 medicine and and Eb, you and I know that there are, there are loads of mechanics who make way more money than doctors and are doing way better <laughs> in business ah. than, than than everybody else in society. You know, in this society. But you know, so I guess it, it, some of those um, warped you know ways of 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 thinking in terms of and and I, I know that we'll probably have to do another podcast for that. You know, in terms of the 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 value placed on labor. You know, because obviously, you know, when you come to this part of the world, you realize that time is money. You know, so the, the yeah. way we value things like labor and, you know, and services is totally different in this society. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what are the things you talked about validation? You talked about um, the, the kind of jobs that we do. What else? Yeah. So, uh, so that was undue expectations. Undue um, expectations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Another thing um, in um, this. OK. And a big topic which we won't go into in detail, um, you know, setting setting things at times in terms of, and this relates to validation as well could be considered as a taboo in in an african home you know a home with african parents you know like where certain things are not talked about like you know like um look at the high rate of you know suicide in the society today yeah. you know and you know maybe based on religious beliefs and backgrounds set some of these topics are considered you know a, a taboo you know 
And um, it's been proven that the fact that you're not, you're not talking about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's yeah. not happening. You know, yeah. I mean, back home when we we're growing up in a, in a typical African home, if you go to your parents and mention the word depression, you know, <laughs> they would nearly <laughs> get Give an exorcist, life. you know, to, to remove, you know, the demon out of you. But, but, but the point is that um, it's um, not, not giving children the opportunity to talk about these things in a healthy environment, in a healthy way, you know, and, and approach some of these topics. If, if for anybody who, who has directly or indirectly been affected by, by, by suicide, you know, you know, and have been, a, been having a, a forum, having, you know, the opportunity to talk about it, you know, with, with somebody is, is very important. Perfect. I'm just going through my devices now to see if I have any questions. Now, okay. if you have any questions and if you're watching on YouTube, on Facebook and on LinkedIn, and you have any questions, please, please feel free to type your questions and Dr. Malaka would answer your questions for you. Dr. Malaka, let me just see. I think I have a comment here on, um, on so a very interesting topic. Oh, well done, Doctor and IB. Thank you. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank so, you. So, what else? You know, we, we've talked about three things: so yes. tabo taboos, um, yeah. validation. There's something else you said. Now, we mentioned um, um, placing undue expectations. Placing undue expectations, and what are the undue expectations? Oh, uh, in terms of in terms of. You know, in terms of um, the career paths, for instance, yeah, or, or, or like in the case of um, of of the, the the example I gave of my brother's friend, you know, <laughs> life choices, you know, a life yeah, path. Because a, a lot of times, right, and this is I'm I'm not being a lot of times yeah. as African parents, this is one of the things that scare African parents is what African parents really want is for their children to marry. Um, so like as a Nigerian, I would love for my son or my daughter to marry a Nigerian because I kind of like feel that we would understand our culture. Yeah. Like we would have the same biographical tools. Yes. Like if I talk about, if I live in Lagos, I talk about Joe Legba, the person knows what I'm talking about. If yeah. I talk about Gary and Granot, an ice block, you know, the person knows what I'm talking about. So one of the fears that African parents would have is, so if my daughter or my son marries a non-African, how would it flush? Like, yeah. our culture is the same. And one of the things that scare African parents is the fact that we as African parents, we like our children look after us. So if my daughter or my son marries outside of my race, are they going to ship me off to the uh to to um carers would i have access to my to my child would I have access to my can can my son come back home to visit yeah. you know or can my daughter bring her family home to visit or is my son lost you know so these are kind of, and these are real fears yes. that we have and yes. i and i suppose that when we now say to our children you have to marry from from our our locality, I think that we we also place um, a lot of pressure on our kids. Because I remember I was watching Guess Who's Coming for Dinner. I love that 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 movie, and mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier was talking to his father, and he was yeah. saying that you see me as a black man, but I see myself as a man. Wow! <laughs> you know that kind of like portrays some of the fears yes. that we have that the African parents have or migrants have yes. and then that kind of is transferred to their children yes I, I you know like one thing that hit me when you're you speaking um Ibi and you know I appreciate you know like what you said because it's you know like obviously there's that general sense of you know sameness you know we we, we are familiar we we kind of get used to what we're familiar with you know yeah. and like you said it's easier you know in terms of understanding culture but part of the beauty of um, of immigration, you know, is the blend of cultures, you know. Yeah. You know, we're moving towards a beautiful Ireland. And you'll be surprised that sometimes when we limit ourselves by not wanting to be exposed 
to other situations that we're used that we're not used to. Mm-hmm. We actually we actually shortchanging ourselves, you know, because yeah. there's so much there's so much out there that we we, we that hasn't been explored because we don't we, we just don't know or we do not care to explore. I mean, it's it's very possible that your that kids, you know, who are second generation immigrants might be interested in other might have interests that we are not familiar with you know they might they might go into gaelic football like in ireland which is like you know the, the popular a popular sport in ireland yeah yeah and 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 there is so there's so much room for growth even for ourselves like our kids could teach us so much you know yes just by watching them grow by sharing their experiences with them and you'll be surprised because like when you, you what you touched on about you know like the intermarriages you know I've, what for my for my short term of living in Ireland? I know Ibi, you've been here longer than I have, but from my from the from my from from the short duration I've I've lived here, one thing I've discovered, or two things I've discovered is one is that the culture here, for instance, I'm using Ireland as a you know as, as a, a reference base, yeah, as a reference base. The the culture here is actually in terms of the family, you know, it's within the family situation is very similar. That too, yes. To Nigeria, to Africa, like yes. the the norm actually, the, the, a, a very common statement that is said in Ireland is that cock women bring their husbands home. So already there is a general sense of oh, people wanting to look after their parents when they are older. In, in in this culture, I see if anything, I see that more as the norm than the exception. From my experience, of people who would choose a, a career path or a job situation or something just because they want to be around or with their aged parents to support them so you'd yeah. be surprised you might surprise yourself if, if you exposed yourself to other experiences it's about stepping out of your comfort zone you know and, and if our kids are going to 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 teach us something new about the world then why not embrace it exactly and and and, and that's that's so true that that's so true because sometimes we and again sometimes we project our fears yes. on our children we project our inadequacies our fears yes. our shortcomings yes. on our children but our children want to breathe and fly yes but we want to clip their wings because mm. we couldn't fly the way they were flying i don't uh, know I, I don't know i don't know no no I, you hit the nail on the head and what's the greatest fear most of the time is that you know like oh if this child goes down this route it, you know it may it may not work out you know but what's the worst that will happen you know at the end of the day like what, one of the main functions of the family is psychological and emotional support you know just being there you know being there to 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 catch them when they fall so, so rather than rather than so rather than limiting their experiences and trying to shortchain them by trying to by by creating their own path for them how about you let them fly you know and you're there as a as a as a secure base as a support to you can be there for them if, so even if they try one path and it doesn't work out they have their whole lives ahead of them to to get it right get it together and try something else as long as they know that mommy is there daddy is there he loves them no matter what and he's there to support them that would mean so much yeah another question just popped into my head What's the importance or how is important is it is it now because I have this my my tits those so <laughs> how important is it for parents first generation parents to take their children home to visit okay well I mean it's um I think it still goes down along the line of um of acculturation mm-hmm. you know, because in the the ideal balance for a second generation immigrant is being able to blend both identities because there's a duality of identity exactly you and i don't have that problem i know where i'm from you know but, but for them uh-huh. you know, <laughs> yeah yeah i know where i come from <laughs> Even if we, I know, sleep. we know now we know we know uh-huh. when we meet ourselves outside the podcast we go talk but, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that for, for for that for that generation they have that duality you know, because like you said, on one hand, they, they they speak, they talk, and they sound like their peers. But when they look in the mirror, they see someone different. And every- I, I think that is where the duality is. It's, I'm yes. sorry, sorry to cut you short. Because mm-hmm. when you say sometimes some some speak, talk, 
act. Yes. But when they look at the mirror, yes, they see the duality only standing in front of the mirror. Some of them don't have anything that connects them to that duality except the look on the mirror. Well, I wouldn't say only though, because trust me, every now and then I believe for the experience of, of an immigrant child, at some points you are going to be reminded, you know, you are okay. whatever you're in primary school. And, and, and could that also be, aside from the traumas and some of the things that we go through, could being reminded? Well, be, being be, reminded, okay. I believe that will only be a problem if the if there is a false sense of identity which has been propagated by negative stories and beliefs. But if I'm proud okay. of who I am, I, I remember I, I know of a young man who who is in America, right? And he's the, the child of, of, um, of Nigerian immigrants, you know? And once upon a time, because he's um, he happens to be of a very fair complexion, yeah. somebody implied that, you know, that actually, you know, that you belong more to this, group of people because you're you're half you know they they, they associated with me they, he was yeah. identified as being a half biracial half biracial and this young man was so adamant he nearly had a fight in school because he was fighting to prove that he is nigerian through and through and how dare you refer to me as biracial i am 100 percent fully nigerian because he had he had this very this instinct sense of value in, in his identity, in who he is. And that has a lot to do with the parents. You know? mm-hmm. so, so we have a, a responsibility. And perhaps it could be by taking them home every now and then. It could be by t- telling them, like you said, like that lady said during your naturalization, naturalization ceremony, mm-hmm. telling them stories, positive stories about your background, you know, where you're mm-hmm. from. I mean, my parents, have always been very good at that you know like they have a story for every situation you know and 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 it it strengthens that sense of belonging of yes. identity of value you know in that child so i, I think it so it, it could be by going home so some people do it by traveling to their hometown every now and then every other and, now and then yeah every yeah, now and or, then or, yeah. or it could be by even even this even the concept of having family over you know yeah yeah to visit and, and and instilling that culture you know of you know like grand you know grandma grand like 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 in like in my family you know if, if any of the grandmas come over you know the kids at uh are, are, are taught that oh when grandma when you see grandma in the morning you 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 have to go over and greet now they don't have to pro- to prostrate and lie down on the ground you know but 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 just basic you know manners you know that you have to you, you have to go to go over to grandma and say good morning you don't just walk past her you don't just say hi well, ex- ex- exactly <laughs> <laughs> hello grandma yeah. so so it's important that your your kids know about about your culture you know because because whether you like whether they like it or not whether you like it or not or, or whether, whether they accept it or not you are a part of who they are Exactly. Now, I want to ask you this, and we've talked about it, but I want us to talk about it in detail. How can you manage a mental health situation if you have a child or a spouse? Okay. Okay. Well, I was was going to talk about how to prevent. (laughs) Okay, let's talk about how to prevent, then we'll talk about how to manage. All right, okay. Because as, as we used to say when we were growing up, prevention is better than better cure. Than cure. Than cure. So we're, we're talking about the prevention now, like yes. uh, validation. Yes. So like like validation, like um, um, creating a, 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 a healthy space for, for emotional expression. Self-expression, yeah. Yeah. You know, so that kids can, you know, like when your child comes home from school after the first day of school in secondary school and they say, I had a horrible day, you know, you don't shut them down by saying, don't you dare say that. You had a blessed day in Jesus' name. <laughs> if you're a Christian or, or you're a Muslim, you know, you say. Or, 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 or you say, you had a horrible, horrible, horrible day because, I had a, because, you know, in, because you know, go, you know, try to go to school. When I'm small, I trekked from here to Cork. <laughs> Oh, exactly me. exactly yeah 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 we, so we we, they, we have to create a, a space for emotional expression um and 
obviously listening, being able to listen, you know, listen to our children. You know, I know it sounds very basic and simple, but it's something that we don't we don't do enough of. You know. But do you do you know why some 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 migrants don't do that? Okay. And I'm going to explain to you. Like I'm just I'm playing the devil's advocate here. So yeah. you know some people eh, they sold land, yes. they sold a house, yeah. they borrowed money, yeah. right? And then they have to pay back all those things. Yeah. So they have to work. They don't even the parents themselves don't even relax. Yes. They're doing like four two jobs. Mm -hmm. wife will do two jobs husband will do two jobs they don't sleep in the house you know but it's like a revolving door by the time you're coming each one person is coming another person is going because they have mm -hmm. bills to pay and then they have responsibilities back home yeah you understand me so at what point do we then not be listening to you when you're expressing yourself they say come out see every day mm -hmm. you do like the complaint yeah, 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 yeah. that is just the reality yes Yes, and 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 I, and I I get what you're saying. You're right, which is why I'm just saying things. devil's advocate. I'm just saying that even they themselves are going to trauma of their own. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So so a family is a sub, should be a support network for each other. You know, so two things that we do instinctively as parents, you know, which are not ideal. One is that we 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 try to minimize our own concerns you know like there's this okay. mentality of when things are happening in the family we, we want to protect our children we, we, but that but in in reality that really doesn't it doesn't really make sense in that in sense that and what i mean by that is that we get whether you try to protect the child from something or not if it's happening it's happening you know so how do we what do you so mean yeah, so for instance somebody is going through a divorce mm -hmm. it can happen to anybody not just because you're you know we're african it can happen to anybody from yeah. any culture. but yeah. so being able giving children a room uh, giving children the opportunity to be a part the of the process now. yeah in, in 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 an appropriate manner obviously so you're not offloading to a five-year-old you know about mm. your problems but just bringing them up to speed with what is happening keeping them because the one one major what what is more traumatic for kids is not the fact that their parents are going through difficulties or divorce but it is the uncertainty and you you propagate that uncertainty by keeping children in the dark because kids are way more emotionally aware than we think so just because you're not saying it doesn't mean that it's not happening they know when you're upset they know when things are not going on well between mom and dad you know they know when one parent is moving out of the household and 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 you're not saying anything makes the problem seem way bigger than it is hmm. so I started by saying that there are two mistakes we make. One is trying to protect them from the realities, it, whether it is financial, whether it is whatever you're on the verge of losing your home, you know, whatever it is, which is not a nice thing to go through. But the family should band together in times of distress. That's one. Then two, we minimize their own experiences. Every generation believes that the other generation has it easier, and and this is not. This is not alien to the Nigerian population. Everybody does it. You know, the Irish population, the America, America everywhere. We always believe that, oh, this new generation, you know, we call them the buttercup generation, you know, Gen Z or whatever we call them. And, and by doing that, we give our children the impression that they have, they don't have resilience and they cannot cope. You know, so any small thing they come, like you said, you're like, oh, you're always complaining, every small thing you complain. But nobody, trauma is not is not nobody owns the rights to trauma hmm. so just because my child doesn't go through immigration challenges doesn't go through um, doesn't have to cross into the country on a boat doesn't mean they're not going through trauma you know hmm. but we all have our own experiences based on you know, we all have different thresholds for trauma based on our experiences based on our exposures our background I mean, I got traumatized just by trying by, by going back to college recently to do a higher degree. <laughs> I, uh, the, I have trauma. I raised my hands up. I'm telling you, two hands. The, the level of stress, you know, for me, you know, whereas to an average 21 year old who is an under who is just finished his first undergrad, mm. undergrad, that is nothing. But but then there are certain things that based on on age and experience and exposure, I, I might I, I might not consider as traumatic, but maybe traumatic to that cohort. So there should be a mutual respect 
and understanding within the family. So you are communicating and you're, and you're listening because communication is two ways. And that's how you model good emotional expression. Oh my goodness. I'm going to school myself. <laughs> yeah. A second master's. I've done some tough courses. But this <laughs> one is, my brain is just going like this. Oh my God. I, I, I feel your pain. My so my sister. feelings are valid. I feel your pain. Not, nothing could be more traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's something you said that that really that makes sense to me. Like sometimes, and I, and I, I and this is not to I'm not um, disrespecting our culture, but there's sometimes when we don't when somebody says something to you, like I don't feel good, I don't feel happy, or I'm feeling sad. Yes. They immediately rebuke you. Yes. For saying that and say, which 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 can you hear feel sad? You know? And they begin to like tell you about other people that have been through worse things. Like I like I say, I said to I like I, one time I, I was trying to explain this whole concept to my husband, and I said that there was one time, was it our dog that died or something? My uh, uh my uh, dog died. I, I was I was doing my uh, was it my SSC BJSS at that time. So we, we were in uh, extension and our dog died mm -hmm. and they came and told me, I cried. Wow. And when the dog died, we were watching the dog die. I mean, what my sister told me, the dog was dying. My dad was crying. My wow. sister, because we, but the dog expected us to do something and we couldn't. And we were all, because I think he ate something or whatever, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then people were around us and were saying, what is this? If she been our dog, do you understand? Yeah. But it was traumatic. And since then, I've not been able to. I remember what, what my first dog, Chips, when Chips died. Chips died in 1979. For wow. a very long time, I was, I was having dreams about Chips. Wow. And then when Trigger died, they told me Trigger had died. Like, I just couldn't take it i was crying and someone said she is just a dog wow. or i broke my nails those days when i used to keep nails in university i broke my nails and like oh my god i broke my nails so I, even if my my trauma is not as much as your trauma maybe you trailer run over your house or whatever but it's good for us to respect people's pain yes it's not good for us to dismiss to say that you had the worst trauma than the, the next person. Mm -hmm. Let's acknowledge people's pain and don't try to make them feel weak. Because I think that what happens is that we have a, a way of making people appear weak because mm -hmm. they are going through things. And so because of the shame of feeling weak, people don't like to share their problems. That is, that is correct. Yeah. That but me, as I was saying today, me, I'm not a strong woman. That nobody <laughs> believed me. I didn't come to this world to be a strong woman. To be a strong woman. I'm a baby girl for life. <laughs> ah. My sister, they're not a carry first for strong woman. They're not a carry first for strong woman. I'm not, not that I'm a super woman. I'm not a super mother. Please. Well, they're well, carry first. Well, but that, that was a very deep story you just told, Ibi. And, and I think, you know, the, the fact that somebody said that to you, you know, like, imagine... I mean, it's great that you had that bond in your family that, you know, you were all able to grieve together. I yes. think that was important. But imagine if that was, that experience you had at that moment was being dismissed by a family member. Th that you, you would have felt re-traumatized a second time, you know. But, but the fact that one, you had already had the trauma of losing, you know, a dear friend, you know, your, the, the, the dog who was the almost dog like- trigger, yeah. Trigger, who was who was almost like a part of who was a part of the family. It was, it was, it was it, yes. Yeah, and and imagine, right. and imagine if somebody now, because by not being a dog person, you know, mm -hmm. and so the person has no concept of your loss, and now and maybe the person is somebody who is meant to be close to you that you look to support for support now dismisses you, and that is what we do every time we dismiss the pain of a loved one because, like you said, nobody has the authority in trauma. You know, there's Nobody no one to say, in trauma now. No, no one can say whose trauma is worse than whose. 
you know, and, and even when it comes to mental illness, another thing I was going to say is that um, there, no, no, no two people have the same experience of a mental illness, whether it's depression, psychosis. So, you know, like, so, okay, two people have depression and you're like, oh, wh why, why is your own taking so much, so, so much time to, for you to get to recover? You know, after all that person had it, that, that's as ridiculous as saying, why does one person's diabetes, why is it harder to treat or more complicated than, than another? Most person. people are the same, you know, yeah. and, and we have to treat every individual person, you know, whether it's within our family, within our community, with respect and regard based on their experiences. Because validation, a little validation will go a long way. Yeah. So you were asking, what are you going to say for one hour, 30 minutes? So we have a few more minutes left. So let's oh, talk wow. about, I, yeah, I told you. <laughs> yeah, you, did, you said, you ah, whatever. But I said, don't worry. You go see what can go happen. So um, mm -hmm. let's see now. Let's talk about, uh, we've talked about prevention, have we? Yes. In, well, not, not in, in, in its entirety. Okay, let's just quickly run through that. Prevention okay. and then we'll talk about management. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned some things and I said, because I believe charity begins at home, as we, as we used to say when I was yeah. growing up. So like the role of the family in preventing or, or in maintaining mental wellness, you know, like I mentioned about um, emotional expression. We talked about that yeah. already. That's, Giving yeah. room for emotional expression, listening, actively listening and engaging with, with our children, you know, yeah. uh, to understand what their difficulties and, and communicate. Put, putting our own limitations and trauma um, and limiting beliefs aside. Exactly. And, and, and making sure that the communication pattern is both ways. So keeping them up to speed with things, events that are happening within the family. And um, I was, uh, also the, the, another role of the family is in, in providing active support. Like, for instance, if somebody is going through a mental breakdown, you know, in recommending or helping them get help, because a lot of the time, somebody who is going through a mental breakdown may, may not be have the insight or be aware that they need help that they need mm -hmm. and they may need professional help and and a lot of the time in my experience it's family members who initiate this process is a family member who say maybe you need to talk to somebody professionally or you know or, or might you know get them to see the gp or the and not everybody that comes to mental health services has a major mental illness because that's part of the stigma it's like oh if i go to the psychiatric doctor i'm going to be grouped amongst the people who are who have but but even in trying to, to reduce the stigma around mental illness. Not everybody who comes to us has a major mental illness. Some people just need support, counseling, to be pointed in the right direction. And the family have a major role in initiating that process, you know, yeah. in hold, holding their hands and bring and working together and bringing them in to see someone. That, that could be invaluable, rather than just telling them, go get help. But you, yeah. if you can do it together. Yeah. yeah. And doing things together is very important because as a family, because like, um, in terms of promoting mental wellness, sometimes we all have the, we all know what is best for somebody else. You know, we're, we're like, oh, maybe that person could do with some exercise, be more social. But it's it's easy to recommend, but it's harder to do. So rather than recommending to that family member, how about doing it with them? You know, so, so you know, like so actively initiating. You could go for a walk together, go to church together, pray together, go go for a walk together. You know, simple things. You know, like encourage. In terms of promoting, uh, helping them to integrate back into society, encouraging them by doing it with them and not just telling people what to do. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, we've talked about prevention. Yeah. Yes. And uh, what would you say to someone who's watching today that could have a family member go into a mental health situation? Okay. So. I would recommend now if you have a family member who's going to a mental health situation, whether it be it a mental health breakdown or, or possibly even having a mental health disorder with some features, which we haven't really talked about in detail, like you know, maybe they're acting in a way that is irrational, or they're or they are very depressed, not engaging, or, or they are having suicidal thoughts. It is this is it, it's very important that we assist them in getting help, which could be by and the the, the primary pathway to seeking mental health care would be through your 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 family your private yeah. physician, your GP. Yeah. 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 So encouraging a family member to go to the family GP, you know, and even in some cases being proactive and helping them book the appointment where the person may not have the initiative based on how bad they may be, how, how, how much they are suffering. You, that you might you might be saving a life 
by taking the, the bull by the horn and, uh, and booking the, the session, the appointment for them. There are also primary services within the community that are open to people suffering from a, a mental health breakdown, such as if somebody is, anybody who is having suicidal thoughts, we have um, um, services such as Pieta House, you yeah. know, and, and such as um, the Samaritans who offer um, counseling support. And, and for young people, we have, you know, services in Cork, such as Jigsaw, uh, there's actually we there are actually leaflets. I actually have a leaflet which I could I could actually um, send you the soft copy. Um, even okay. A, okay. After this Very program. good. So what about people? So th this is for people living abroad. Now, um, there's something um, people living in Ireland. And just sorry to cut you short because the thought just came to my mind. So yeah. we're talking about, you know, the effect of um, what you may call it now, a relocation. Yes. On the second generation migrants. Jackpa. But again, yeah, Jackpa, Jackpa. But <laughs> then there is what about the people that are left behind at home? Yes. That yeah. is something that we're not even thinking about. That, that is I true. was talking to somebody and she lives in Lagos yeah. and all her family members have left. Yeah. And wouldn't we see an increase in mental health breakdown on the other side where, you know, the older generation are having mental health breakdown because their own children are leaving, like all their nieces and nephews. What, like in Nigeria today, yes. the color of family has changed. Yes. Because a lot of, People have their children relocating. It's just father, mother, and maybe a relative or somebody somebody working for you. So even that meeting together as family is is it's it's not the way it, it used to be because all of the all of the children have, have relocated, and then you want then your mother or your father to to come, and some of them can't travel because some of them have arthritis. Yeah. And arthritis is bad for the bone. So there is there is something is happening that is that is bigger than all of us. And even when a lot of parents would feel that relocating, their children relocating is good, but there's a flip side to it. Yes. There's yes. a flip side to it. You know. And I and I think if you're talking about the effects of, of Jakba on I think it, it cuts across, it's on everyone, you know, like and the long-term effects. Are probably going to be, are yet to be seen. Are yet to be seen for maybe another couple of or maybe another you know few decades. You know, in terms yeah. of effects on those of us who are here, who are not from here, who might eventually at some point decide to relocate back home, and our children will probably not come with us. You know, and and yeah, for, I mean, and, those and are, for, those are, yeah, and the family we left behind as well. So, so the effects, the long term effects are, like I said, like you rightly said, are yet to be seen. And how how to prevent some of that is. One is the fact that the the family is gradually being fragmented on both sides. Yes, you know, we are here, and and we we don't have the luxury of the extended family as it yes. used to be. You know, yes. back then. You know, and then we have family back home who are losing. You know, missing loved ones. You know, yes. who, who who have who have gone abroad and may never ever fully relocate back. You know, and they are also losing the whole. Yes extended family and support that they all that once knew as well. That they once knew. And and the impact of that in, in the long term in mental, on, the, on the mental health of individual on people. On both sides. On both sides is it, it could be quite severe. And and there there would uh, my projection is that there, there would have to be a shift in both in the mentality because you know stigma is a major problem back home in Nigeria where you know seeking support for mental wellness and you know things like counseling will be frowned upon as, you know, not being, you know, like if, if you're, exactly if you're a Christian, you know, uh, and you believe in God, you know, God forbid that you have to talk to a, a mental health professional, you know, there will have to be a shift. And also the, the definition of family worldwide is slowly changing. Reimagining. You know? Yes, we have to, there has to be a reinvention of the wheel as, as in as supposed to, it can't always be the typical father, mother, you. children, you know, it's becoming a, the, the term family, is becoming is having is having a, a much broader you know um perspective you know we have different types of families now you know very complex family systems 
you know, because of 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 this um, trend, you know, in in yeah. relocation. Relocation trend. Dr. Malaka, thank you very much for coming in EV Speaks today. Oh, th I, thanks for thank you. For I, it was you were wondering what am I going to say in whatever I know. thirty minutes, and so it's guys, so listen. Quickly. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And um, so if anybody wants to contact you in any way, I don't know, just for further questions or anything, like, I don't know if you can do that. How can they contact you? Mm. Okay, I, I know we'll probably, um, maybe we'll talk about that, Ibi. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll I just asked. <laughs> I, I know, I, I know. I'll, 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 I probably, know. I'll probably have to give you a link. Yeah, we'll, yeah. So we can get questions across. Yeah, that's very yeah. important. Perfect. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope you learned a lot like I did. And you can follow me on my social media handles, Ibinabo NAB LinkedIn, Ibinabo NAB Facebook, Ibinabo NAB Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And next time on EB Speaks, we're going to continue the conversation on mental health on the migrant community as a whole. So until then, see you again. And Dr. Malaka, I'm going to call you. And bye, everybody. Mwah, 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 mwah. Bye, Dr. Malaka. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.